Welcome to the monthly truck stop webinar brought to you by the Motor Carriage Insurance Education Foundation. These truck stops are presented the second Thursday of each month at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. These webinars are open to members of FMCIF. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat window. They will be answered as time allows or responded to after the webinar by email. If you experience audio problems, please send us a note in the chat window or call 800-741-484. We will attempt to correct the problems as soon as possible. Today's subject is why motor carriers need general liability. Uh, it's gonna be presented here with my help with Steve Hartman. Uh, welcome, Steve. Tell me a little bit about your company. Thanks, Tommy. I'm happy to be here today. Uh, Synchrono Group operates under our uh, uh, trademark name of Synchrono Sure, and we're an insure tech managing underwriter uh, that is focused entirely in the small business arena. So we we built a business that is at kind of the convergence of technology, data, and uh, highly experienced underwriting staff. Yeah, and of course, you go back and we go back a long ways uh, from our friendship, and we appreciate that. You have been in another market. You're still in Raleigh, which is a good location to be in. As you know, I was born about 40 miles south of that, so I visited there often. But uh, anyway, and you are one of the products that you have put together is a journal liability policy or program. So I thought we would, this is one reason we reached out to you to help this, because we not only want to look at what ISO is doing, but what some of the unique markets are, because Unlike most risks I know, meaning when I was a retail agent writing contractors or writing distributors or property, general liability was never a question because it usually was rolled into a property coverage as mm -hmm. part of the commercial package policy or a BOP policy and, and not written by itself. And only when I started focusing on the trucking for insurance that I realized these people don't always buy general liability. It was one of the things we always started with. So this is a unique information, um, a unique place to look at because it's not always available with the companies writing the other lines of insurance that we typically would with any other kind of risk. This is what you found, is it not? That's correct. And, and you know, this is uh, to a certain extent the tail wagging the dog, right? The, uh, you know, if you're looking at a trucking company, it's got five power units. Uh, in today's market, that's a $60,000 auto liability policy. Uh, and typically the general liability exposure for that same customer is only going to be maybe a thousand dollars. So exactly. it gets lost right. uh, on, on occasion. So what we're saying here, smaller motor carriers do not often buy purchase unless someone makes them. Uh, that making usually is who, <laughs> Steve, their customer, right? <laughs> it's typically whoever they're hauling for. That's correct. Uh, could also be the bank if they've got if they're sitting on uh, you know lease requirements or or mortgage instrument requirements from a bank, uh, but ultimately it's somebody they're trading with uh, that says show me that you have the right coverage to make sure that their interests in that trucker's operations on their behalf are being met. Uh, you obviously writing on your general liability, pro general liability program and the other programs you used to be in where you're writing everything on a liability and all that. You find most of the brokers and shippers do require general liability now, where about four or five years ago, that was something they didn't really pay attention to. That's correct. That's correct. And, you know, the the uh, the nuances with general liability as opposed to the way the auto liability policy works is the GL policy effectively covers everything unless it was defined or excluded uh, in the terms and conditions of the policy. Right. Uh, and that's different than the way the auto policy works, uh, specifically covering uh, whether it's covered vehicles, uh, uh, specifically listed vehicles, specifically uh, named drivers, uh, and so on. So when we think about sooner or later, that trucker that you're insuring, the people that are listening to us, particularly retail agents, are going to get somebody requiring certificate insurance. And the problem we have, based on what Steve just said, it's easier to write it when you're writing the auto liability to meet this area because the actual cost, if they cannot get a certificate to haul that load, that profit or that income from that load will pay for the general liability policy. And it's tough to put it in midterm and get it turned around in time for them to pick up that load. So that's, the, the, that's even correct. though they don't ask for it or want it, it's something retail agents need to explain to them. Look, particularly the new ventures, they don't realize this because new ventures are going in with the cheapest program they can and general liability is something that they don't think about 
Uh, we'll talk more about because of home and all that kind of stuff. But this is when you need to address as a retail agent and be kind of forceful, I would think, Steve. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, the the obligation on the agents are to make sure that the coverage is right based on their uh, their insured's business operations, uh, and that that requires then the agent to really understand the insured's business and its operations uh, in total, not just what they do or how they drive while on the road, but actually whether or not they have a business premises, whether there are third parties that go on those premises. Uh, it uh, it also pertains to how they contract with people. Uh, because what's buried in that contractual language uh, oftentimes is uh, is uh, coverage grants or indemnification and hold harmless provisions that actually expose the trucker uh, for uh, potential operations of the shipper uh, for, for whom they're hauling. Yeah, and so this takes us to the next slide. When we look at the information, everything that they're doing can help us with auto liability if we write that. And then the needed, the other needed part, I've always said, uh, Steve, is the Google Earth information. What's at the insurance location? Because this is where you add an exposure that you typically don't get in auto underwriting. Uh, in auto underwriting, you know, if the different drop and hook or tankers, and we have some feel for their obligation for loading and unloading, we'll go through all that stuff later. So they look at Google Earth to see what's there. I assume you all do too as a part of the underwriting process because you want to make sure if there's a garage there or a cross docking or, or even parking for vehicles to come that took with their owner operators and all. So this is also something that you look at too to find as a, as a helpful uh, uh, add to the auto liability uh, underwriting. That's that's correct. You know, in, in terms of understanding where that insured operates and, and what the neighborhood environment is like, you know, if they've got rigs parked on an open parking lot uh, that they own, uh, that parking lot can become an attractive nuisance at night and, you know, teenagers will be teenagers. Uh, so uh, understanding, you know, what the premises uh, are uh, and and how that trucker is operating out of those premises uh, is absolutely part of our consideration. So, and a lot of the policies are written today where unfortunately, unlike the past where the agent is actually visiting the insurer, particularly smaller motor carriers, and they're doing it now all by telephonics or, or, or Zoom and all that. So just like when we talk about writing the auto liability, you don't want to write the auto liability without a safer report or a CAB or carrier software report. So here you don't want to write general liability, I would think, without a Google Earth to look at what that location is to start with. So you can ask them some questions about it as you are talking to them about the exposures and completing the app. That's correct. Our, our business process, actually, we engage uh, through the internet with 10 different data providers. Uh, we pull back about 250 pieces of data and information on every one of the accounts we look at. Everything from property exposures to their OSHA claims violation histories to bankruptcies, liens and judgments. Uh, and then also uh, relative to their civil litigation histories. So all of that stuff comes back into our systems in about four seconds time. Uh, and it's all useful for us in augmenting that underwriting decision to provide coverage and to determine at what terms and conditions and ultimately at what price. Right. And what if the location is the motor carrier's home? We find a lot of them working out of their home, but I find this is a conflict in this, Steve, because sometimes they're, we're going to talk about the difference in being a proprietor, or individual, and incorporated or not. But if all they have is a homeowner's policy, it usually excludes anybody coming to that premises for business purposes, which could be their driver or it could be a snap-on tool person delivering uh, uh, tools, and they could get hurt there. So a lot of times they feel that they don't have a, a exposure that way. And second is, if they're an individual, then and yet... I mean, and their com trucking company is a LLC, a corporation, then the homeowner's policy extend no coverage to them anywhere in this area. And yet that's they think they have coverage. Uh, and I find that uh, uh, hopefully yeah. not many small motor carriers are still uh, uh, operating as a visual. My comment is that they're dumb enough to be putting everything that they own on that on that 18 uh, wheeler that's running down the highway weighing 80,000 pounds and 70 miles an hour with a skull and crossbones on the front of it. They're crazy. So they need to incorporate. But this is also the first area that they think they have, but a lot of times they don't. That's absolutely true. You know, and your your personal lines policies, both the auto and the homeowner side, you know, don't cover business pursuits. Uh, and particularly with respect to the the very small owner operators where it may be one or two power units, they can often be operating out of that that uh, individual's residential uh, address. Uh, and 
uh, from the standpoint of the business owner, then the trucker, uh, you know, the reality is they've got a lot of money tied up in those rigs and they've got money tied up in their home. Uh, and the last thing they should uh, do is expose those assets to a lawsuit that arises out of what their business does. Uh, and so properly organizing that business to shield the asset base uh, is the first step that they should be taking. And then the second step is, is uh, purchasing the appropriate kinds of insurance to make sure their business activities, both on the road and off the road, are appropriately protected. So I find fewer and fewer are operating as individuals on this area, but that's something that as a retail agent, I would want to talk my insurer out of. It's ridiculous that they don't do that. And I yep. think we're saying the same thing. That's where you want to start with. Uh, yep. Make sure they're yep. set up right before you start selling a piece of policy. Selling a policy. Yeah, it's not an expensive or difficult process to form an LLC, uh, which uh, you know is, is uh, one version of a business enterprise, but it effectively walls off the personal assets. Uh, certainly, as you get up in size, the corporate form can change into more of an, a, a corporation as opposed to a simple LLC uh, with, uh, with additional shareholders other than the business operator. And you already, this next slide, you already uh, got my, uh, you got a little bullet or a head and a gun here uh, because the general liability policy is the mother policy. That's the one everything starts. As you pointed out, it covers everything that's not excluded or doesn't meet the definition of coverage in it here. Whereas I, I this included on the bottom of this, if you look at the auto liability policy, it says we pay for and uh, pay for anything arising out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of a covered auto. If you read the garage policy, garage operation or dealer's operation. If you read a professional liability policy arising out of a professional liability. If you read employee practice liability policy arising out of a covered event. The general liability policy stops there. It says we cover everything unless we exclude it. And so this is actually where we should be starting in coverage instead of adding it on the back end, like you said earlier, where the dog right, the tail's wagging the dog. That's, that's correct. And you know, under the, B, under the, uh, the CGL policy, uh, there are three, three main coverage parts. And so you've got a coverage A, which is the bodily injury and property damage that, that arises from uh, accidents, uh, including potentially repeated or continuous exposure. Uh, that come from the insurance operations. Uh, the coverage B is personal injury and advertising injury, and coverage C is, is the uh, medical payments. Uh, but the main concept is that the insurer is paying as damages uh, because of bodily injury or property damage uh, to which the insurance applies. And uh, you know the provision is obviously that the bodily injury or property damage takes place in the coverage territory, and in the standard CGL policy, coverage territory is basically the United States and potentially uh, other parts of the world if employees are traveling. On the territorial, uh, yeah, yeah. Yep. So there is a duty to, to defend in that policy. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the policy will respond to claims brought against the insured uh, at a minimum for, with defense costs covered uh, subject to reservation of rights letters. So that just means the insurance company is going to step up and, and handle the initial defense while they're trying to figure out whether or not they really owe the uh, defense. And, and there are a lot of times that there are two things that happen. It could be an act of, uh, we're going through some of coverage here. I just put some things together that I find that's most often brings the policy into this policy. And I'm going to hope you'll share with me some examples you all have. Not to scare other underwriters away, but just to realize the things that they got, that, that they got to look at. But if it's not there, there's a conflict sometimes between the auto liability and the uh, general liability carrier. And if there's no coverage in general liability, the auto carrier ends up paying for uh, for things they shouldn't at least defend. In fact, you have been around long enough to remember when Northland decided many years ago to roll general liability onto the auto form because they were defending auto general liability claims with no general liability on the form and actually were given a package that, that paid for the general liability for smaller motor carriers because they realized that because they had the cost anyway. So this is where we're dealing with this. It just, it just makes sense to have everything covered. Yeah, and you know, certain certain claim uh, circumstances can actually result in claims coming at the uh, the trucking company from a couple of different directions. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit later about action over types of uh, types of circumstances. But you know, ultimately, when you're you've got an insured contract and you're ending up providing additional insured status under that insured contract, uh, you're agreeing to uh, to step up on that that party's uh, behalf if something bad happens. And effectively, that's what policies cover, right? It, it promises to pay when certain bad things happen. 
Um, but uh, the policies, uh, and the, the one uh, caution I would give uh, all of the people listening, is that uh, every sentence, every comma, every clause in a policy is an opportunity to either gain or lose coverage. And <laughs> as we get into the action over conversation, I'll give you a specific example of that uh, from a court case that, uh, that was brought a handful of years ago, but still is a uh, cited case today. They, I try to put a couple of things together, Steve, just to tell you a reaction where the auto liability it has to work together. Uh, and this is even if the insurer doesn't have a premise, they have this exposure. And the loading unloading is, is the number one area that a trucker might have that's not premise ex located. Uh, and it's any risk that doesn't drop and hook, meaning no touch free. If the driver has to do any loading and unloading, their hand loading and unloading our trucks or forklifts or whatever, there's a gray area between auto liability and general liability. I use some examples here, and the one that I liked about this, the most often one that was misunderstood, was someone who's an auto hauler, and they were unloading the auto, and they were driving the auto off, and they hit something and did damage to something as they were driving the auto off the auto, hauler and mm -hmm. the insurance company who wrote that said they're not covered because that auto they were unloading was not a scheduled auto was not a covered auto well they don't understand that was cargo and they were mm -hmm. unloading the cargo by hand and the car all the liability policy covers it to it gets to its final destination which in this case was the dealership or the used car dealer here and you know what the underwriter came back and said oh i didn't think about that when i wrote that risk I mean, that's the thing you got to think about, uh, and and it's to the final destination they have here. And you know, tanker has to do the hoses unloading part of it. If you're a flatbed, it, all of those have to be unloaded by something that's not attached to the unit itself. So that would be the the forklift or the crane or things like that. Uh, even reefers and drive vans sometimes the drivers are involved with with uh, with pallet uh, jacks and and forklifts and things like that, Steve. But to me, this is the first obvious exposure that everybody has other than a drop and hook, you know, unloading animals by hand. They don't realize it's covered until it gets its final destination. And I find that this is one of the areas that does overlap in auto or not. Yeah, and now, again, paying attention to what that policy form says uh, can mean all the difference in the world. You know, a lot of companies are ISO based and all their language right. follows. Uh, excuse me. Thank you. We're, we're talking about ISO based wording and they can modify that later. And I, I got an example of doing that. I was going before we yep. get off the slide. And so, You're right. Appreciate I, you. ISO tried to, to clean that exposure up a little bit in 2013 when they made a revision uh, to uh, exclusion G, which exclusion G on the GL policy is for aircraft, watercraft, and automobile. Right. Uh, and they extended uh, and tried to clarify in the definition there of how coverage would be applicable. And that uh, that exclusion uh, applies to BI or PD arising out of the ownership, maintenance, use or entrustment to others of any aircraft, auto or watercraft owned or operated or rented or loaned to any insured, not just the named insured. And, and in a few minutes, we'll get into that nuance. Right. Uh, but uh, it also then includes the operation and loading or unloading. The exclusion includes uh, loading and unloading, yeah. right. right. And so they were very carefully trying to articulate, uh, and again, this this came from uh, coverage law uh, that uh, was, was aimed directly at the ambiguity in between where does one policy start and the other uh, stop uh, between general liability and auto. So they made an effort to try to clean that up. But again, it, it you know, it pays to, to pay attention to every word in the policy to understand where that where that obligation starts and stops under the terms of the, the uh, policy. We're going to look at G in a few minutes, and you're absolutely quoted that. But I also want to bring in here the definition of loading, unloading under the general liability policy, which is exclusion, mirrors the exclusion auto policy 7 and 8, which is handling a property and mobile equipment. So where one covers, the other doesn't. When the other one covers, the other one doesn't. So this is how the two work together, That those two exclusions. But I also, we ran into something for the annual conference. We're putting a program together about last mile delivery, Steve. And mm -hmm. this is a new gig stuff. And now this last mile delivery is sometimes expanding even beyond this because now you've got people going in and installing things in people's homes or even invasion going into those homes, which you have a tendency to, 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 to hurt the people in the home and all. So now with the 
with the new gig economy where we not only take it from a warehouse to a store, we're now taking it from warehouse or the store to a house and we're dropping it off of now not on the door, but inside the house in the laundry room or the kitchen or things like That's that. Right. This is really extending this loading and unloading further than that part of it. And it gets to the point, and I'm sure there's a lot of discussion on your side if you write any of this, when is it at the final destination? That's correct. And, you know, they, the underwriters tend to focus on, uh, you know, is it to the threshold or over the threshold? Uh, and then kind of the separate question from that is, well, what are they, do what are they doing if it's over the threshold? Uh, and in a lot of cases, you know, that, that uh, uh, trucking company or courier service uh, may have a stated policy that all they do is drop it off. Uh, but I've seen my own wife do this. Well, she'll offer the driver and their helper, you know, 40, 50 bucks to bring it into a certain part of the house uh, rather than having me, you know, throw my back out doing it. And so the employees who are in, in defined as insureds under the policy can inadvertently create additional exposure for that trucking company by doing things you know, off the books. Uh, but the trucking company is still at risk uh, for any of those actions uh, that, uh, that create BI or PD that arise out of the, uh, their operations. And before the gig economy, I actually addressed that early on, and as I think we've had a discussion, it's for the non-emergency medical, where they're taking the, the person in a wheelchair off of the truck, taking them to the doctor's office, they're unloading that person, which is property, or, or uh, which is quote cargo, to its final destination office, and if they turn that wheelchair over, we have to pay, and if it's not excluded, but standard ISO, for that damage to that person. They don't realize it extends that far. So yep. this is where I put together where I thought the auto and general liability will always work together one way or the other, and, and it, it, for no other reason you need this. Now, the other things you're talking about, contractual, are very important, but this is where the auto just doesn't cover everything other than drop and hook. Mm -hmm. That's correct. You mentioned these smaller motor carriers, uh, Steve. Uh, North Carolina, where you are, is animate that everybody has work comp policies <laughs> if you have an employee in your transportation. Florida, you don't have to have work comp until you have more than four, four or more employees. And there's about you know eight states for that limitation. And I find often a motor carrier only buys work comp when it's required by law. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm driving my truck and I ha had my second truck and had my son-in-law or, my, uh, or uh, my neighbor to drive that second truck because the state does not require me to, drive to, uh, to have work comp, I don't buy it. Do you find this often for when the, the state allows this? Uh, absolutely. And then you've got the added wrinkle in states that uh, that allow employers to opt out and provide coverage through an occupational accident insurance product. Texas and those yeah. states, right. And, yeah. And, and ultimately, if, if uh, an employee, uh, and this can be a paid employee, a volunteer employee, uh, or in certain states now, there's been a move uh, to classify subcontractors as employees. But if an employee gets injured while acting in course and scope of that employment, uh, then comp is supposed to be the remedy. Uh, the action overexposures can can drag back uh, exposure on the general liability side of the policy. But uh, um, the uh, you know it's an it's an important underwriting consideration in the general liability to make sure that comp is in place where it's supposed to be in place. And if it's not, the problem I have with this, Steve, if it's not, then there's no coverage in the general liability policy if they're true employees. We'll talk about owner operators and independent contractors on the next slide. And they think they do. I had a case, and this was before the North Carolina law changed, where you didn't have to have, the truckers now didn't have to have it. They still had a numerical explosion in it. Some good friends of ours that if I gave their name, and I don't want to give them here out of West Salem, uh, had a case where the drive, they fell under that threshold. And the, uh, and the, the agent actually told them, sure, you need, you need work comp now. And they said, I can't afford it. Well, now they got, they're over the threshold. Now they got an injured worker driver and they called me up and said can i have somebody to fight the work comp case tommy can you help me and i said i said uh billy uh you don't need a work comp lawyer you need a bankruptcy lawyer yeah <laughs> because you got no coverage fortunately and this was absolutely uh, fortunate this will happen only one out of 100 times the the person hurt didn't want to that wasn't trying to get a pound of flesh they just wanted their damage you know just one medical the lawyer they had was relatively 
relatively uh, uh, reasonable. And I ended up helping settle that case. So they didn't have the lawyer thing, but he had to mortgage his warehouse for $300,000 to do that. And, you know, they just don't think about those kind of exposures here. Uh, my comments always been anybody but happy family members and being divorced twice, I understand that limitations need to be covered by work comp by the insurer because they just don't have it anywhere else. And I, I find out this is another area where agents aren't, are, aren't aggressive enough to, to kind of force that part of it. And work comes with no problem. Yeah, because you're talking about five or $6,000 a truck. Yep, workers' comp is supposed to be the sole remedy for th bad things that happen to the employees while while they're in the course and scope of their employment. Uh, and it differs a bit from the occupational accident products because occupational accident, unlike workers' comp, typically has a stated limit on medical uh, and also has a stated period of time for which the disability component would be applicable. Workers' comp theoretically is for lifetime on disability and lifetime on medical. Uh, no matter what those numbers equate to. So, you know, you can very easily go upside down if you don't have workers' comp and, and your employee gets hurt. Uh, and, you know, let's say it's a substantive back injury. Uh, you know, those are those are several hundred thousand dollars at a clip. Uh, and when you don't carry comp and the employees know it, the simple reality is if, uh, if the driver got hurt getting in and out of the truck, uh, that same driver might uh, act like they had a slip and fall accident on your premises because then they could theoretically, you know, provide uh, uh, or angle for coverage uh, through the GL, uh, alleging an unsafe work site. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a quandary for the small business operators, uh, because I, we, we operate as a small business right now. We started a business two years ago. So the reality is, you know, small businesses are typically operating on a cash strap basis. So they try to make the best decisions to ensure that they can operate. Uh, and so on the, the side of the truckers here, their insurance is very expensive for the over the road exposure. You know, cargo is not that cheap. FISDAM is very expensive for the, uh, the rigs themselves. Uh, they, they often forego some of the other coverages uh, under the mistaken uh, belief that they really don't have exposure. And the one thing I want also emphasize, I'm gonna emphasize a little bit more on the independent contractor because it is typical for independent contractors to have the occupational accident policy. But even if, if they're a true employee and that employee, employer, the motor carrier says, look, I'm not gonna carry comp, but you gotta carry occupational accident policy. They don't realize that, that employee can collect occupational, occupational accident coverages and still sue. That's because correct. they don't extend toward immunity. Uh, I've always made a comment that just gives them enough substance to go find a lawyer <laughs> bad enough. Now, there's two things. Sometimes they'll be happy like the one I just explained to you if they get everything paid for. They don't want to get a lawyer involved in it. They're not trying to be punitive. The second thing is you can't collect twice the same bill. So it's occupational accident, but the occupational accident policy would seek subrogation back against the negligent party. So again, we, we talk about that in this area. So as an employee, yep. that would absolutely not be covered and a concern. And the same thing would say if they're an independent contractor, we have the same concern on the next slide. If the independent contractor is on the insured premises and gets hurt, they can sue. The problem here, Steve, is they're not an employee. And again, I don't want to get in the debate about uh, AB5 and all that stuff now because yeah. that's all up in the area, era, but they're not an employee. So therefore they can sue and the general policy would have to respond absence that's of correct. a non-ISO endorsement because they're not yeah. an employee anymore. Yeah. And this exposure, you know, the, uh, the subcontractor exposures are growing in the transportation arena right now, given the driver shortage. You know, if a small trucking company has a good contract with a shipper with frequent work, and for whatever reason, they don't have the manpower and the, potentially the units to handle the work. They're going to sub that out and try to maintain the contract themselves. Uh, and by subbing that out, they're going to have these owner operators coming onto their premises, which expands that third party liability exposure. Uh, and it's absolutely an underwriting consideration. Or under the customer's uh, premises. Or sometimes the customer. it could be bought in here going back to drop and hook. And here's where the big misunderstanding. We already talked about occupational accident policy. And understand that even if they have it, they can still sue. The general liability policy would have to respond. Well, the previous slide, the concern is the, there would be no coverage that they would have. So therefore, the owner-operator or that independent contract 
excuse me, that employee could own the trucking company. That would be the first slide. This one they think, but even if they require the owner operator to have work comp coverage, independent contract, work comp coverage, that still doesn't extend toward immunity to the motor carrier who's not the employer. In That's fact, correct. the only thing the, for an independent contractor to have work comp is so the motor carrier doesn't have an audit premium due. It doesn't extend toward immunity. And a lot of people don't understand that part too. Well, all, all our owner operators have work comp. Well, they might have work comp, but they're still uh, uh, not an employee and get hurt but because of the negligence of the motor carrier, they can still sue. I don't know if you've seen any of these, Steve, but this is a real concern. I, I find that misunderstanding in that area. No, it's a, it, it, and those claims happen. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if a, if a party uh, gets injured through the operations or premises of an insured, uh, that party typically, especially if it's a serious injury, that party is going to look at all potential avenues for recovery of money. Uh, and so literally they'll sue everybody they can. Uh, and they'll at the same time potentially bring a claim under the workers' comp policy if there's one in place. Uh, but, uh, at, you know, the, the policies are designed to limit exposure to potentially paying for the same claim in multiple uh, circumstances. And much formed, right. But the, uh, at the end of the day, those claims do happen and they're expensive. Well, and the thing that they, they also I think underwriters overlook in this, particularly the GL underwriters in this area and the retail agents, because they can still sue, even though they don't, the OCAC carrier or the work comp carrier can seek subrogation back against the party who was negligent causing their policies to pay. So they need waiver subrogations in these OCAC policies and these work comp policies in favor of the motor carrier because that's, that's an area that they don't have, even though the employer, I mean, the independent contractor doesn't seek that. Their work, their carriers could seek that who paid for their injuries. That's correct. And, you know, in a different part of our economic cycle, uh, the uh, shippers uh, had a heck of a lot more say over what that contract between the parties looked like relative to indemnification and hold harmless kinds of language. Um, the, uh, in the current environment, where shippers are finding it difficult to move loads just because there's a driver shortage, uh, the trucking companies have a better opportunity to negotiate mutual uh, language, which is, was, uh, is written on an equitable basis between the two parties. And this helps. The other area that I find that, that, that today's world, and, and we have a lot of this discussion, uh, in fact, I have uh, heard uh, uh, a pushback about the guns in the truck and the federal law on that. We, you know, I'm, there's some advertisement even now in a trucking company will allow you to bring your animals in the truck, besides, mm -hmm. I guess, passion and all this kind of stuff. And those, those animals and those guns are there, and you can make an argument to what? Protect people and property. And mm -hmm. the general liability policy excludes intentional acts, but not intentional acts that are for protection of person and property. And, you know, if your insurer's dog bites somebody as in a truck stop or something like that, who was too close to the truck or heaven's know that you, you've heard some of this uh, uh, road rage that you have mm -hmm. where there's somebody shot here and they use those guns. That could be covered by the general liability policy, but I find that most people running general liability for smaller motor carriers exclude that, Steve. And That's this correct. is an area where like, the agents can be aware yeah. of that because if they write nothing but standard GL, this is an exclusion that you're going to typically find in a trucker's GL policy. That's correct. And, you know, the, uh, uh, the exclusions are both in terms of assault and battery exclusion and then separately relative to firearms and, and potentially animals. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the CGL policies are interesting in that uh, they can provide uh, coverage when acts are unintended. Uh, so there is a differentiation between intentional act and unintentional outcomes uh, in a lot of the case law. Uh, but yeah. in, in this regard, um, you know, the animals are, are being allowed on, uh, on the rigs now uh, with the drivers uh, largely out of companionship needs. Uh, well, yeah, and, not out of protection, but at the end of the day, though, animals animals are territorial. So if if somebody climbs into that rig who's not supposed to be in that rig, that dog could respond adversely, uh, and uh, that does create for the trucker because they're the owner of the rig uh, or the operator of that rig, and that trucker then has that liability uh, for uh, for those actions.
And 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 my, my concern here again: be aware that this is typically excluded here. If not, I don't know of another. Op I don't know of another way to buy it back. I guess you could buy an individual policy for that part of it, but that would be something that I think an agent needs to highlight to that insured. If you have guns, if you have animals in there and they damage the, the public, you might not have any coverage on your general liability policy, depending on the market that you use. That's correct. There are some in, insurance companies that actually write a monoline coverage for firearm liability. Right. And That's it's not very expensive. Uh, it's it's sold on an individual basis, uh, so it's personal lines kind of coverage. Uh, but that would be the appropriate place to find the coverage if the gun is not owned uh, by the or furnished by the employer. Right. Now you mentioned action over again, and this is the third exposure. And and we're talking about these are contractual obligations. This is the contracts and insured signs. Steve, most of them are not really brokers. It's usually if it's if it's a broker, it's because the shipper is making them there. Typically, this is where the ship, the broker, I mean, the motor carrier goes onto the premises of the shipper and, and then they want to protect themselves from anything happening on those premises in case they get uh, something gets injured or somebody gets injured. They get named in the suit. And the, the, the term uh, the term you use is action over where I typically as a retail agent deal with action over until we've had discussion in GL and I've heard this up a couple of other places this recently. That's where you have the employer has two exposure. One is employer and the second one is the manufacturer of what hurt the employee. And so you buy that the, the exclusion back. In this case, you're talking about the contractual obligations, are you not, where the insured is holding the customer harmless for injuries to their employee, to their driver, to the independent contractor, different wording in that, even for the negligence of the shipper. Yeah, that's that's correct. I mean, the, the concept started you know, many, many years ago, uh, and New York is probably the most uh, infamous jurisdiction for it, but it started and revolved yes, around- How about everything? <laughs> it, it started and revolved around, uh, you know, workers' comp uh, claims interacting with the general liability coverage, but, you know, an action over, uh, sometimes it's called a third party action over, uh, but uh, it's type of action in which uh, an injured employee uh, after collecting workers' comp benefits from the employer, files a tort claim against a third party. And uh, neg with negligence alleged uh, from the actions or inactions of that third party uh, as a contributing cause for the employee's injury. So um, the, uh, uh, the extension of that, if you swap out there a couple of terms, uh, and instead of injured employee, you could put in injured party, Okay. Uh, and um, collecting work comp benefits, just put in damages uh, from uh, uh, from that uh, uh, in, uh, uh, shipper, uh, for example, and they can file a tort claim against that third party if contractually we're pulling in under the definition of insured contract and the CGL policy, that relationship between shipper and trucker, for example, uh, we would find ourselves on the CGL policy responding to those other claims. Uh, and, you know, the devil is always in the details. There's a lot of case law in this that goes back uh, easily 25 plus years now. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately, the uh, uh, even even for the employed driver of the trucker, if, they're get, if they get injured on the premises of the shipper, uh, they theoretically would have recourse under their employee's uh, employment relationship for the workers' comp coverage. But there is nothing in most states that precludes them from also filing a general liability claim against the shipper. The shipper's own policy would respond to that uh, coverage and then seek indemnification under the, the, the uh, indemnification language of the contract between shipper and trucker uh, for any potential exposure. Um, the, uh, as, with, as with everything else when it comes to underwriting and policy coverage, the devil's in the details. Uh, so understanding the general nature of the contractual language that a, that a trucker uses or is uh, forced to use uh, to get their loads and move their loads, uh, understanding whether that uh, language uh, picks up sole fault or partial fault uh, is, uh, is one of the underwriting considerations. Uh, and also it should be the, under, the uh, consideration of the agent to properly advise then their customer on, you know, here's kind of best practices. Uh, without providing legal advice, there are things that the insured, the agent can point out 
for the insured's benefit saying, maybe you ought to look at this. Maybe you should look at this in more detail. Maybe you should look at whether the indemnification hold harmless language is one way or is it mutual uh, and make recommendations along those lines. And, and again, uh, ultimately it's up to the, uh, the insured to take advantage of legal counsel where it's appropriate. Uh, and but this is back, excuse me, yep. go ahead. Uh, go, no, I was going to say this also, also ties in with primary non-contributory. Uh, and so when you get into the additional insured uh, status. Well, that's the next slide. Let's, let's, I want to talk about this consider, co co contractual consideration. Because here there is a little uh, three factors you have to deal with. First off, you mentioned the employee on the insured's premises. I've had a case where the shipper loaded it and they sued the shipper. The employee did, as you said, after the collect work comp. And the underwriter uh, uh, denied coverage because they're an employee. They didn't realize that, that that exclusion has an exception to exclusion. That's independent, and that is for the insured contract. And so the typical ISO jail and lily policy would have covered that under the term insured contract if they, if they actually held a shipper harmless for those things. But I find often that you exclude the broad form contractual and GL. You don't an auto liability, but they do in GL. So this is something you're going to look at that's, that's different than that. Also, how does the anti-identification statutes of the state laws come in place, Steve? Well, I can, the, the uh, anti-indemnification, if, if a, uh, the contractual terms around uh, indemnity uh, are deemed to be against public interest, then those contract terms are actually voided. Um, the, uh, the states could actually be classified, I think, into five different buckets, uh, and it splits along the lines of whether or not uh, obligations like that can be transferred under contract, and if so, are they transferred in whole or in part, based on who's, who's re the responsible negligent party. Uh, so that's the concept of partial fault or, or uh, sole fault. Um, the, uh, uh, under the policies, you know, the employer's liability exclusion is where this is supposed to get addressed. Uh, but is often uh, not in the st standard ISO language. So carriers and underwriters uh, have opted to replace the standard uh, exclusion uh, for employer's liability in the policy and basically add to it a couple of provisions that actually further restricts how it would apply uh, in potential uh, contractual uh, uh, liability considerations. And also, don't you find most trucks, especially company, also though excludes that paragraph and that says we cover you for contractual when you assume the tort liability of another. A lot of general liability carriers for trucking uh, either puts the modification in it where it only goes back to vicarious liability and or actually excludes that part, which you don't do that in the general general liability policy you buy for apartments or distributors or, yeah. or furniture well, stores, something they need to be aware of. Uh, even on the trucker's uh, GL product, you'll still see blanket uh, additional insured uh, when required by written contract. Well, uh, was, this is insured is another thing, and I got this next page. Uh, unlike auto liability, which builds into that blanket additional insured, the general liability policy you have to add by endorsement. So it's not automatically there. And typically in that area, as you just said, you, you, you could have the broadened wording that is on a blanket basis uh, that would uh, cover anything as long as it's required within the contract. But that's just the Adams additional insurer. That doesn't necessarily take care of the contractual obligation, though, does it, Steve? The, uh, well, I was going to say the devil's in the details, again, because they may attach the broad form uh, additional insured uh, when required by written contract, but then in the language of the coverage grant they're providing, they actually restrict uh, what contracts are actually covered and how they could be applied uh, uh, in, uh, in different circumstances. So, um, the, uh, and typically, you know, the, the additional insured, uh, underwriting companies vary on whether it's an, an explicit additional premium for the endorsement, uh, and, uh, or whether or not they've embedded that cost in kind of the general premium and it's already there. Uh, but one way or another, uh, you know, the underwriters generally have a charge for it somewhere. Um, the, uh, uh there's about 35 different base forms for additional insureds. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and um, you know that's a whole separate session just on its own. Uh, right. But uh, you know the uh, the additional insureds can either be issued on a blanket basis or on a specific basis. Uh, when it's on a specific basis, then you know that that named counterparty is going to be inserted there, as will a specific address for coverage. Uh, and you know the additional insured status, uh, which has been cleaned up by ISO over the last ten years. 
the additional insured status actually defines where and when uh, their coverage will apply. Uh, and relative to things like defense costs, which are typically in a standard CGL or outside the limit of insurance, uh, may also define whether or not those defense costs are going to be inside or outside. Uh, and that's a written contract for inside, but so you'd have to go back to those things, right, Steve? This is the point that the making here is that it's unlike auto liability, which I preach, and I just sent a carrier notification, or they want to know about blanket addition insured, and I we've written a couple of white papers. It's built into the policies itself already for auto liability. General liability is different. There's a charge for it. You have to add to it. It's not assumption that way. So you got to be careful in those how you approach those things. Then the wording arising out of, or does it pick up the other stuff involved in it? That would be thing here. Now the one that I focus on most often. You already talked about this is my. The, this is the G. This is the this is the jail liability exclusion that, that the only one in the general liability policy I'm aware of that excludes auto liability or excludes autos, and, and it's here. And I, I guess the thing is, that, as you pointed out, it, everybody looks at it excludes auto, but it only excludes autos owned by, operated, loaned, or rented to and insured. And in this case, the reason this is important, and insured in this case would include employees. So mm -hmm. uh, this is where the auto liability policy buys back non on auto, and non on auto includes employee liability. But really, Steve, this is not on auto coverage. Uh, this area yeah, and you know, the exposure uh, is a broker yeah most most of the uh, underwriters in this space actually try to exclude the non-owned and hired as an additional exclusion that gets attached to the policy so that exclusion g has kind of a clarified intent right this is where it's very often modified i was going to point this yeah. out we're quoting standard iso wording but but you and other carriers try to limit that part of exposure particularly if there's any chances of brokerage exposure out that's correct and uh, but this is the concern of non on auto uh, this area and and the other area here that we don't have same thing if you're insured has a garage operation and they work on other than their own autos or autos that are leased to them many own operators and that work fails that could come back on the general liability policy and that would be covered under general liability policy because it's not an auto that's owned operated rented or loaned to the insured except for test driving it obviously. That's correct. There's two basic segments for coverage under the GL policy. One has to do with the premises and operations of the insured, and the other has to do with products and completed operations of the insured. So right. one of the underwriting considerations uh, as we look at business is whether or not they do uh, mechanic work uh, for third parties, uh, because that's a different risk than a simple trucking class code represents. Yeah, because, and people don't understand if it's their own truck, the auto policy that we quoted earlier covers ownership and maintenance of an own truck. So if That's that right. work fails, it's still an auto claim. But if it's not yep. on auto, it's not. Uh, if it's not covered auto anymore. So this is sorry, This is also, by the way, where we already talked about loading and unloading, where you find a loading and unloading exclusion is also in this exclusion G. Now, uh, I've had this happen all the time. And I think uh, when I uh, dealt, when we first did this, we even had this question, you and I talked about it. You know, I, I had this not on trailers, uh, on the insured yard or, or own trailers on the insured yard that do damage. I had one out of Chattanooga many years ago that actually fell on top of a of a of a, uh, of a snap on tool guy's truck. And the policy says we only cover trailers while attached to a covered auto. That's the new wording that you have in the uh, in the symbol seven or symbol sixty seven for non owned trailers. But it, it, trailers have to be a covered auto. And what they find out, they say, well, that's covering GL. It's not. Trailers are excluded in in GL if they are used off the insured for the purposes off the insured premises, even when they're on the insured premises. And if they're licensed for use of the highway, then they'll never be covered under GL because that meets the definition of, of auto. And that's even correct. if it's a non-owned trailer, if it's not attached, there's no coverage here. So this is why it's so important to make sure that all trailers the insured uses are covered autos in the auto form. That's correct. The uh, under exclusion G, it, it actually defines the uh, uh, you know what an auto is, and so that includes the power unit. It also includes trailers and semi trailers uh, under the definition of auto. And uh, 
uh, it does it become a anything licensed for the use of the highway or have to meet finance responsibility of why in the states they're right. operating on it too, which is where all the trailers have tags on. That's correct. So now, uh, you know, it gets a little muddier as you think about uh, your yard equipment. Uh, so if you've got an old tractor that you use to move trailer, you know, from point A to point B on your premises, that's mobile equipment under the definition of the policies, as long as it doesn't carry a license. Uh, you know, if it's not being used on, on public roads, uh, you know, that's moving your equipment on your own property. Uh, but that does potentially create liability if there's third parties that are injured in the process. The, uh, you know, when, uh, the, when an insured drops a trailer, their trailer, let's say it's going to be loaded the next morning or unloaded the next morning, and that trailer is sitting on somebody's lot, not attached to a power unit, uh, that can become uh, an attractive nuisance. Uh, and, you know, people can climb on it, get hurt, fallen off it or whatever. Uh, and again, that's supposed to be picked up under the automobile policy. Some creative attorneys try to figure out how to make claims under both. Uh, but uh, the way that this is defined in exclusion G, it's pretty clear that if that uh, trailer, semi-trailer or a power unit uh, is subject to licensure requirements, uh, the reality is that's supposed to be covered on the automobile policy. I, uh, I've had the opportunity to assure some uh, garden centers and some stuff like this, Steve. And one of the things that drove me crazy here a while back is they were having a load of, of, of hay or, or, or straw, excuse me, mm -hmm. and the trailer sitting on their yard that was dropped there with, and letting customers come in and pick up the hay and take them off themselves. Yep. If they fall over, that's still auto. It's not general liability, it's auto because yep. that trailer had to be uh, had to be licensed on the road and it's an activity connected with a trailer and they never thought about it being auto not general liability here and so this is a concern that getting as and I really appreciate you putting this because you and I come from the same school the fine print of the policies become very important to understand yep. those then put the operations in place to see where they fall or don't fall because it could come back to turn here but this is a concern also, and I'm sure you have seen this conflict too about completed operations, where the ISO policy is unique in it. It, 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 it doesn't contemplate that the trucker has a complete operation because that's where it shifts over back to the general liability, uh, the general liability policy. Uh, it doesn't have once it's um, trucker unloads it, then the operation's over. It becomes the customer or whoever they properly they unload responsibility to it. So they don't have a general liability aggregate. They just have a occurrence limit and a general aggregate, but not a general liability aggregate. But it really doesn't exclude general aggregate. I mean, a complete operation it just doesn't have a separate aggregate. How That's often right. do you run into the people not understanding that part? Because you didn't put a product complete operation exclusion in it, but it doesn't exclude product complete operations. It just excludes an aggregate. Yeah, the, uh, you know, the, the limit structure has, has been this way for a long, long time. And, and uh, it's pretty common in the industry that you've got your per occurrence limit subject to the general ag. You've got a separate products and completed ops limit, which is stated essentially as in the occurrence and in the ag. Uh, and so the, uh, you know, kind of the nuance, obviously, on the GL side is whether or not a uh, trucking company, let's say, let's say, for example, they've got 10 locations. How do their limits apply? Is it at the policyholder level? or is it per location? Right. Uh, and you often endorse that GL policy to provide limits per location, which is the best way to think about it. Uh, otherwise, you've got uh, theoretically, you know, 10 locations, you'd have one tenth of the, of the potential coverage there. One location could use up uh, the full limits uh, and the other locations may be left running bare. How long have you been writing general liability? Personally? I've, been in the space, uh, I've been in this space for 33 years. Have you ever seen the aggregate run out? Yes. <laughs> so, How often in 35 so. Yeah, not so much on the small account space. I mean, I, I believe very strongly that, you know, the, you know, the, the bigger the account becomes, and this is true for any line of uh, insurance business, the bigger the account, the more likely it is you have higher severity uh, associated with your claims. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Have you seen anybody like, run out that wasn't tied to a product? Uh, not on the product completed ops side. Yeah. You know, on the on the general liability side, so the uh, the premises operation side, you know, if you had two or three one million dollar losses in one year, yeah. uh, if you a couple of, of uh, those claims in one year and they're all severe uh, losses, you can actually uh, 
use the uh, the general aggregate limit in its entirety. Um, yeah, but I'm it's not, still I'm fairly not rare. I have only come close one time in my many many history yeah. here, and it doesn't happen. The other thing is unique, and again, most of the cup stuff written. So I'm telling you, standard ISO folks, but you got to go back, as Steve said, and look at individual individual uh, policy wording and how they do this. But if it was written under standard ISO rules and a minute area, the premium base does not include clerical sales and driver are not included in those premises. So their payroll is excluded in this part of it here, which makes a smaller motor carrier until they have a premise with a yard person or warehousing or cross docking or things like that. They don't have anybody to generate general liability premium. And so that's, you and yeah, a lot of correct. people have modified this. So you might want to talk about that for a second too. Yeah, the, the underwriters. Uh, yeah, the underwriters in the truck GL space uh, fall into two camps. Uh, there are a subset of underwriters who provide coverage with a rate applying based on the number of power units, uh, and that usually works to the advantage of the insured when they've got three or four units or less. Uh, and there's others that actually do it uh, following the ISO approach, which is going to be payroll. You know, essentially, it's non-driver payroll. Uh, as you point out here, uh, with the excluded uh, payroll being sales, clerical, and, and the uh, driver payroll. So effectively what gets covered are the mechanic payrolls and any yard employees. Uh, and it's a fairly limited amount of money typically. Uh, you know, uh, Truckers with uh, 25 power units might have two employed mechanics. Right. Uh, you know, you get down around 10 or 15 units, they might have one. Uh, you're down there in that solo operator territory, one, two, three, they may not have any. Uh, and as a result, the, the premiums charged for this coverage are actually fairly nominal. Uh, you know, these are thousand dollar policies, could be down around 600, could be as high as, you know, 10 or 15,000 if you've got a, a fleet of 300 vehicles. Um, but it's not consequential premium when it's compared to the auto liability uh, side of the, uh, the policyholder's expense. So this gets back to to the final slide we have here that we, we're going to talk about. Uh, Steve. Steve, it throws up on me where I can't move the slide. There it is. <laughs> All right, right, okay. Tell me a little about your program at the very end, Steve. Uh, uh, here we got a couple minutes on this area and, and why you got into this space. Uh, obviously, you saw a need to it. Yeah, the uh, again, this this the GL coverage uh, is oftentimes the kind of the forgotten coverage. Uh, the agents and brokers tend to really focus on where the big uh, premium dollars are uh, because usually that's where the big exposures are for the uh, customer. Uh, the claims in the general liability space are typically not frequent. And so the uh, truck GL usually runs uh, at a fairly high profit margin uh, for the insurance companies. Uh, and often uh, it's, it's written at a minimum policy writing premium level. Um, the, uh, uh, what I like about it is uh, our approach to underwriting it by leveraging all those external uh, sources of information and doing that literally in seconds. Uh, our, uh, we use artificial intelligence to augment our underwriting decisions. So. Uh, as all that info comes back into our systems, behind the scenes, our underwriting algorithms are running and it literally scores every one of those risk characteristics in less than a second and a half. Uh, we integrate uh, here with some additional pricing uh, tools that we use to help frame the uh, pricing for the accounts. And then the underwriters make uh, ultimately the final determinations. But we're in a position actually to provide bindable quotes uh, on our preferred subset of our business in less than 30 seconds from when an agent or broker or CSR hits submit. Uh, the, uh, you know, for average, below average risks or the larger risks, the underwriters do spend a little more time with those. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the system actually highlights the information for them in a different way. So our process, instead of uh, having an underwriter start at line one, page one of an Accord app, and then working through the next 12 pages plus a supplemental, um, our system actually highlights for the underwriter the specific risk characteristics that kept that account from being defined as preferred. And so they can uh, apply the underwriting judgment where it matters the most. Uh, uh, and now you write directly retail agents and through some wholesalers. 
That's correct. Our, our product is offered in 48 states right now. It'll be in 50 as soon as the uh, carrier has its final approvals. Uh, the two holdout states right now are Iowa and Maine, and I think both uh, insurance departments just have backlogs. Uh, but we write on Sutton Specialty uh, Insurance Company paper that's an A-8 uh, company. Uh, we started this program this year. Uh, we offer limits uh, up to a million dollars per occurrence, two million in the ag. Uh, we do have an enhancement endorsement that expands coverage. Uh, you know, it does include blanket waiver of sub row. It includes the automatic additional insured when required by contract, uh, but it's narrowly defined. Uh, we include primary non-contributory there. We've increased the med pay limit to 5,000. Uh, and then we also have the ability to, uh, we have a base property damage legal liability limit at 500,000. We have the ability to extend that up to a million dollars. Um, the, uh, the process is, you know, slick, quick, and easy, and that's how we designed it. Um, the uh, we want our agents to get back to producing their revenue. Uh, so rather than spending three or four hours on a truck GL policy, submitting it to five different companies, and then waiting for the questions to come back, uh, we can actually do those transactions in a couple of minutes' time. Steve, we appreciate you spending the time with us here today, and we hope people got a very deep into looking GL. Encouraging is retail agents quote it offer it they'll need it be aggressive in that area and underwriters here's some thoughts that maybe where you'll help you underwrite here if you need any more information contact mcief um, we're offering this uh, membership and the, the designation and the truckers you at our website mciF.org and we'll see you next month steve thank you be safe my pleasure take care tommy